Ignition sequence start. Five. Everything. Three. Everything. Sounds. Sounds. This is Everything Sounds. I'm Craig Shank. And I'm George Drake Jr. This is Everything Sounds. It's a sound that has sparked curiosity and speculation around the world. In the 1980s, I think it was, a recording was made of um, a whale that was unusual. It's a sound distinctive from other whale vocalizations heard before or since. Some physical abnormality in its sound production, uh, maybe akin to a human with a lisp. It's a sound that's believed to be a single whale that vocalizes at a unique frequency, 52 hertz. 52 hertz is close to the bottom range of what most humans can hear. The audio was actually sped up 10 times to make it easier to decipher. In a 1999 paper on whale call data for the North Pacific, William A. Watkins from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and his colleagues wrote, This sound source has been the only one with this call structure in the entire listening area. We have been tracking this call since 1992 and have not identified the whale species. Perhaps it is a hybrid. In 2004, Watkins and his colleagues wrote another paper on 12 years of detecting the 52 hertz whale in the North Pacific, saying that after 12 years, the whale was still a mystery. In the years since the signal was first heard and tracked, 52 Hertz has been nicknamed the world's loneliest whale because some people assume that other whales can't hear or understand it. Although there's been no visual confirmation of 52 Hertz, scientists are fairly sure that it's a whale. There are characteristics to the signal. Even though the frequency is off of what you would expect, the signal type is of a whale call. My name is Darlene Ketton, and I am a joint appointment between Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and Harvard Medical School. The sound has been recorded in an area of the North Pacific where whales are often found. And those characteristics that she mentioned, they are distinctive from other sounds like fish or boat propellers. It is not impossible that it's something else mimicking a whale call structure. But so far, we don't know of any underwater minor birds that would be doing that. There are over 80 species of whales that we know about, and they're divided into two categories, toothed and baleen. 52 hertz is unlikely to be a toothed whale because they tend to have this sac in their nose that allows them to make a variety of sounds. These clicks and buzzes and high-pitched noises. That aren't found in the 52 hertz signal. It's most likely a baleen whale because they seem to use their larynx to produce lower frequency vocalizations, much like the 52 hertz whale. They don't have vocal cords, but they are capable of producing moderately complex sounds. Most people are aware that marine mammals use sound to communicate, but we often don't think about how critical those sounds can be underwater. Because they're dealing with an environment in which light doesn't penetrate well, Most of the communication that goes on is likely to be purely acoustic, purely through sound. And because they rely so heavily on sounds to communicate, they have the ability to make and hear sounds that we can't hear, because frankly, we don't need to. The nuances, therefore, the subtleties of communication have to be carried in those sounds. So they have complex signals both in the frequency range we can't hear, ultrasonic, or below our frequency range called infrasonic. That range goes incredibly high. They can hear up to, in some species, 200 kilohertz. But it also goes much lower. Imagine the lowest sound you've ever heard. Now go lower than that. And for example, the lowest note on a standard 88 key piano is 27.5 hertz. And they can hear down to 10 hertz, essentially hear earthquakes. But even if we recorded every single sound that whales make, we still wouldn't have an idea of what they're communicating until we could associate those sounds with the whale's behavior. So until we actually have recordings that we can interpret, which usually means visual, uh, we need to be able to see what the animals are doing 
and uh, record sounds from enough animals over a long enough period of time to tie it back to that activity. So to get that visual information, just follow the signal and find the whale. But one whale, Pacific Ocean. Well, the term needle in a haystack comes to mind. This is Bruce Mate. I am the director of the Marine Mammal Institute at the Hatfield Marine Science Center, Oregon State University in Newport, Oregon. Bruce was asked to join a team trying to track down 52 hertz for a documentary project called Finding 52, the search for the loneliest whale in the world. They'll likely start their search in the fall of 2014. To get a sense of what it's like to find a whale, any whale in the ocean, we went to the Atlantic Ocean and took a whale watching trip out of Boston Harbor. We'll be backing out in just a moment here. Captain's about to sound the horn, so if you're on the outer decks, you might want to cover your ears. It was supposed to rain that day, but luckily it held off. Though the waters were still a little bit choppy at times. A little bit choppy at times, really? Yeah, it wasn't bad. They slowed the boat down, and it was fine as long as you weren't walking around all over the place. (laughs) Well, apparently it was fine for you, but for me and the other people around us getting seasick... Well, some more than others, it seemed like. Right, exactly. That's what I'm saying. For those people and myself, the maybe more regular people than you, it wasn't just choppy at times. Like it was inconveniently choppy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, that, that's a fair point. The waters were choppy, and it probably took us about twice as long to get out to open water in the Atlantic. Exactly. But the crew had everyone on the boat uh, keep an open eye for any signs of activity. But after a while, it seemed like nothing was going to happen. Oh, and they didn't use any special equipment to help find the whales for this sighting. Um, equipment wouldn't help out unless we satellite tagged them, which people kind of are working on trying to get better ways to do that, just for research purposes only. That's Orla O'Brien. She was the naturalist on board that day, and we just want to let you know she was speaking on her own behalf and not in an official capacity for either Boston Harbor Cruises or the New England Aquarium. Instead of using any technology, they simply just chart a course based on earlier whale sightings and use binoculars, their own eyes, and experience. So if she wanted to find, for instance, a humpback whale that they named Pinball, she knows exactly where to go. Um, I would head to Jeffrey's Ledge as opposed to Stellwagen Bank, which is in Massachusetts Bay, or um, the Great South Channel, which is off of Nantucket. I would definitely head to like her area first and then from there you really just have to look. So we all combine our sightings and um, report on them. So you kind of will learn like, oh, pinballs back or salt's back for the year with a calf, you know. Eventually they spotted a whale spout in the distance and they made their way closer to it. Our boat stopped and we were actually close enough for the crew to see some of the markings on the whale. And guess which whale we found? It was pinball. They weren't specifically searching for pinball that day, but she happened to be in the area. She was surfacing every few minutes to get some air before diving back down to continue feeding. She was one of the few whales that we saw that day. We also saw a smaller minky whale, which just popped up for a minute and then vanished. And there were two other humpbacks nearby. But pinball, she kind of stole the show. This gets to an important point, though. In nearly four hours, we only saw four whales. That might seem like a lot of whales for that trip, but think of it this way. We found those four whales, but we weren't specifically looking for any of them. So you can get a sense of how difficult it might be to find one particular whale, not just any whale that you happen to find. Granted, when Bruce Mate and his team go out on their expedition to find 52 Hertz, it'll be an operation that's less touristic than ours. Touristic? Is that a word? (laughs) Touristic. Uh, It is now. I'm going to call Webster's. (laughs) (laughs) Great. What Craig is saying is that our boat was pretty big and had hundreds of people aboard. Things are very different for Dr. Mate. If they manage to find 52 hertz by listening for its distinctive call, the next step is to tag it for tracking, which isn't as simple as it sounds. First, they get in a rather unobtrusive boat. A small 
inflatable vessel. They approach the whale slowly, as not to catch it off guard. Alert the animal or, or make it startle. And when they're close enough, they can put a tag on the whale. The size of my ring finger and about the length of a ballpoint pen. Which sounds pretty big, but to a whale, it's like a pinprick. It's not that bad. And these tags can have different kinds of information about whales. How much time is spent at different water depths, sometimes about physiological information like heart rate, vocalizations. We have some tags that have three-axis accelerometers in them where we can actually see a sperm whale lunging to grab squid or a baleen whale making a lunge to collect krill. As we mentioned, much of what has been written about 52 Hertz has focused on its loneliness or its supposed solitary nature. By tracking 52 Hertz, we might learn that it's more like other whales than most people think. In fact, it's not all that unusual for whales to travel alone. Amongst baleen whales, it is completely typical that the whales move as individuals. The fact that you find baleen whales clustered about in certain areas is more a product of why they are there. It's entirely possible that 52 hertz ends up in those certain areas for things like feeding and reproduction. So the question is, if some whales are solitary by nature, how did 52 hertz become the world's loneliest whale? I think it's easy to anthropomorphize animals in general because giving them, I'll say, human attributes is comfortable for us. That's what we know best. In other words, people make assumptions about animal behavior that may be based primarily on their own emotions without fully understanding the behavior itself. Perhaps reflecting on an animal with a very unique vocalization pattern, we think about that as being lonesome, but I, I, I'll be honest, I pretty much doubt that when it comes to reproductive behavior or feeding, that that's going to be any kind of a handicap. In the case of 52 Hertz, discovery has helped drive curiosity. Although it may have led to an unscientific narrative, it has still helped generate interest and enthusiasm for this unique whale. But public interest in science can be a balancing act between what we tell ourselves and what the science actually tells us. The fundamental principles of science are logic, proof, careful reasoning, and not getting carried away by just your imagination. While it's a great idea to convey information about science in a way that makes people animated and more interested in the topic is good. What you don't want to do, though, is to encourage speculation and or extrapolations without applying that rigor of logic. Although the science points to the lonely whale scenario being unlikely, perhaps that original spark of interest towards the 52 Hertz whale shouldn't be abandoned. Frankly, where sound was what started the interest, sound is what's gonna draw us in to find the animal, and it's unusual. It may not be totally unique, but it's largely different from other things we hear. And it won't surprise me if what we see is something we're pretty familiar with. It just sounds unusual. You can find out more about Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the Finding 52 documentary, read the papers by William Watkins we mentioned, and also see a video somebody took of Pinball the Humpback Whale the day that we went whale watching at everythingsounds.org. Everything Sounds is part of the Mule Radio Syndicate. Find out more about shows like Decode DC, The New Disruptors, and the broad experience at muleradio.net. Thanks to Rachel McDonald for helping out with today's show, as well as Mustafa Shaheen for composing the music. And a special thanks to Boston Harbor Cruises and the crew of the Cetacea for allowing us to record the whale watching trip. If you want to help spread the word about the show, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and SoundCloud. Find all of those links at everythingsounds.org. And please tell your friends about the show. Be great. This production is a part of the STEM Story Project with support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Presented by PRX, the Public Radio Exchange. 
Thanks for listening to Everything Sounds. Until next time, I'm George Drake Jr. And I'm Craig Shank. <laughs>